Hello, everyone. It is a privilege and an honor for me to be invited to present at this uh, wonderful meeting. I'll be telling you today about uh, the opportunity window for therapeutic development in Kabuki syndrome. So just to briefly go over what um, Dr. Bjornsson has set the stage for, uh, Kabuki syndrome is a multi-system uh, disease in which uh, a lot of systems of the body are affected. So we see the morphological anomalies such as eye dysmorphology, fetal finger pads, as well as short stature. But we also see some functional impairments such as developmental delay, intellectual disability, clinical anxiety, heart defects, renal abnormalities, hypoglycemia, and hearing impairment. So when we think about therapies, we really are thinking about th therapeutics for multiple different uh, systems of the body. And so far, we do have some options for some of the systems, such as the hearing impairment, or the hypoglycemia, or the high, uh, heart defects. But we are still in the discovery stage for developmental delay and in intellectual disability, as well as the short stature aspect of Kabuki syndrome. So just to understand uh, the mechanism in a simplified uh, version, and I think Dr. Bjornsson has really did a great job, but I'll go over it again. As we all know, uh, inside the brain cells, there are chromosomes, and these chromosomes are made out of DNA, and this DNA is cold, uh, coiled around proteins called histones. And on these histones, there are Methyl, methyl groups um, that regulate gene expression. So if you have the methyl groups, the gene is not expressed. If you don't have the methyl groups, the gene is expressed usually. And what adds and removes these methyl groups are uh, two proteins that are of concern to Kabuki syndrome, the KMT2D and the KDM6A protein. And when these two proteins are functioning um, very well, then there is balanced gene expression and we get regulated hippocampus development, which leads to neurotypical development, learning and memory. However, when these two proteins are not functioning well or um, are uh, deleted or hypo uh, insufficient, then the addition and the removal of the methyl groups is dysregulated, leading to dysregulation of gene expression. This in turn uh, leads to impaired hippocampus development. And as, as a consequence, we see developmental delay and intellectual disability in um, individuals with Kabuki syndrome. So we really are concerned about the hippocampus development. And just like Dr. Bjornsson has mentioned, um, intellectual disability is thought to be untreatable because uh, the, the current dogma is that if it's prenatally developed, then perhaps it's irreversible. So we have some good news actually that may contradict this uh, dogma. We know that the hippocampus can re regenerate postnatally. And like I told you, the hippocampus is the most important um, part of the brain for Kabuki syndrome. Um, and we think that some of the uh, pathogenesis caused by KMT 2D variants uh, can be postnatally um, in part and we also know that there are available drugs um, that target the methylation pathway of KMT2D and KDM6A. We also know that there are promising preclinical therapeutic strategies that we could make use of. So I mentioned the drugs and the preclinical therapeutic strategies, but when do we really uh, provide these drugs? When do we give these drugs in order to obtain the best, um, um, the best outcome? Um, is it right after birth? Uh, and, and is that too young for participants to participate in clinical trials? Or, or do we give it to uh, teenage and adults? And would that lead to false negative results because it's too late uh, of an, and the opportunity window for therapy is already missed? So in order to answer this question before we um, start with the clinical trials, we developed a mouse model uh, that would have the Kabuki syndrome variant 
uh, which is a KMT2 variant after birth, post postnatally. And the idea of this mouse model is that, as you can see here, uh, this is the KMT2D gene. And what, what, what we can do is if we inject these mice with treatment uh, after birth, then we excise two of the exons, um, exon 50 and 51, causing a deletion in the gene and so abrupting the um, function of KMT2D protein. So before we start with this mouse model, we wanted to quantify and see if we could really induce that deletion. And uh, I'm showing you here the controls that were not injected. And I'm showing you those injected after one day and then after two weeks uh, uh, post injection. And you could see that we actually did induce the in deletion um, 14 days after injection. So this is really cool and reassuring that we could use this model. Um, and uh, we wanted to use it to see if we find the expected phenotypic outcomes uh, that we saw in the beta geo model that Dr. Bjornsson has mentioned in his presentation. So this includes the growth restriction where there's um, lower body weight for uh, treated mice. It also includes the hippocampal neuronal pro proliferation um, anomaly, which leads to behavioral phenotypes resembling the Kabuki syndrome neurological traits in humans. We also wanted to see if this, there is dysregulation in gene expression, as well as if there is hypoglycemia and disrupted ketosis. Now, these are the findings from the beta geo mice uh, that have been found by um, others and published. What we have found uh, so far is uh, the growth restriction phenotype, as well as the hypoglycemia and disrupted ketosis phenotype. And I'll expand on the growth uh, restriction phenotype. We see that those mice that were postnatally treated to induce the deletion in KMT2D actually do have a lower weight than those than the controls that were not injected. In order to confirm this result, we need to recapitulate it in older mice, in female mice, and in homozygous mice because our mice, so uh, the treated mice so far have been uh, heterozygous. So they have one copy of the deletion and one copy of the non-deleted allele. Next, we also uh, saw some increased uh, blood ketone level uh, in these treated mice compared to controls. And although the difference is, is, is very uh, little in numbers, it is actually um, very promising in that we are really affecting the pathway that may be involved in Kabuki syndrome and regulation of glucose levels and ketone levels. Uh, by postnatally treating these mice. So in order to see if this is actually um, a phenotype that will be consistent, we do need more time points. So here I'm showing you after three, do three days of injection, um, and we would need to recapitulate this in homozygous mice as well, because these were also heterozygous. So in conclusion so far, um, I hope to have convinced you that we see some Kabuki syndrome resembling phenotypic traits in mice uh, that were postnatally uh, treated to induce a KMT2D aberration. Um, and if uh, anything, this actually suggests that perhaps KMT2D does have a postnatal uh, role in development that we could potentially rescue by uh, administering therapy uh, postnatally. The other part that I hope to have convinced you of is that by seeing elevated blood ketone levels in these uh, postnatally treated mice, we think that there may be a metabolic pathway in Kabuki syndrome that uh, is, uh, is, um, that is affected and perhaps it opens uh, more windows for therapy for Kabuki syndrome. For the future, we uh, will continue working on phenotyping these uh, mice uh, and checking other phenotypes that have been re reported in the beta geo mice. We also uh, would like to test the medication effectiveness um, 
uh, in ameliorating the postnatally induced phenotypes. And uh, in conclusion, of course, our overarching goal is to establish that uh, optimal window for treatment and therapy administration uh, in mice and then consequently in um, individuals with Kabuki syndrome. And with that, I would like to thank the Bjornsson lab where all this work has been done. And uh, of course, nothing would have been uh, done without the contribution of patient families and their collaboration. And uh, thank you to the funding resource of this project, the Lumaji Foundation.